So let me start with the three of you. Uh, both Helen Clark and, uh, and Foreign Minister Brende mentioned that things are going in the wrong direction. Never have we had so many conventions signed, never such a strong normative framework, mm. and, and never such tools. Why do we see these horrific violations of human rights? Do you like to start, uh, Mr. Brenda? As I said at the beginning um, of my intervention is that on the overall agenda when it comes to poverty eradication, we have moved in the right direction. Mm. Unfortunately, in the field of human rights, I think we have in the last years uh, seen uh, new documents being produced, but the compliance with these documents have been going down. And what we really are seeing in the 21st century is that universal rights, universal values are being questioned, and one see and claim that these are Western values or the values that just are some specific values for some countries, and one are also arguing that these are domestic issues. This is something that we cannot accept. We cannot be in a situation where global values relate and universal values related, for example, to girls' education, to the right to assemble, uh, to the right to speak your mind, the right to be different, the, the, and tolerance is under pressure and where we see that things are going in the wrong, uh, wrong di direction. And what we know also from the Rights Upfront Initiative is that if human rights are being deflated and not taken seriously, this is the beginning of a negative circle for a country. So we have to address this. We cannot um, neglect it. And uh, we just have to put it on the agenda. And I think the strongest message that the world can send is that during the development and no negotiations for sustainable development goals that will last until 2030, human rights and good governance has to be part of this document if it's going to be a real valuable and impactful document. And then we can also measure if countries are delivering on this. Mrs. Ponsiani, do you also see this contradiction about reality and the normative framework and the tools that's there? Yes, there's no doubt that there is a such a disconnect between commitments made by state in by signing on and ratifying conventions and what happens when it comes to implementation. For us at the office, UN Office for Human Rights, I think 2014 has been one of the most difficult years. We have experienced crisis after crisis. We have experienced gross violations in a large number of countries. And perhaps I would just hazard a hypothesis. And that, that is that um, in a sense is the recognition of the value and importance of human rights that in itself is creating a backlash in those governments that do not want and in those institutions that do not want to recognize the right of their people to express their voice. Mm -hmm. We have seen at one hand the strengthening of the normative system, the strengthening of the engagement of international partners working in developing countries to promote human rights and we see a backlash in the form of strong cultural relativism in we seem to be have some technological challenges here <laughs> and i'm not the one to address them is it better now thank you um, we see we see a cultural relativism that tries to nibble away at the recognized universality of human rights by arguing that our cultural specificity needs to be protected. And I fail to understand what that really can mean when in terms of cultural specificity we are all human beings. We are all alike. So what is so culturally specific in one or other than another context? So it's not a cultural specificity issue, but it's really the political desire to maintain non-transparent autocratic modes of governance and therefore of control 
and the fear that giving voice to citizens may question the authority lines. Helen Clark, do we see a, a fight of values here? I, I, I think I'd make three points about the current distressing situation. Firstly, as Flavia said, uh, can anyone remember a time when we have simultaneously seen so many complex emergencies in our world and out of these dreadful conflicts has coming so many human rights abuses and, and violations? And this is affecting a, a number of the Arab states and a number of, of states uh, from Somalia and the Horn of Africa through South Sudan, Central African Republic to the Sahel uh, at, at, in particular. Now, some of these terrible conflicts uh, are born out of, out of transitions from what were uh, sometimes, quote, stable authoritarian regimes to something better. The court came out of the bottle. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, repressed uh, uh, pressure came, came up and out. Uh, and people have fought to retain power uh, in, in various ways. And, and there's been, uh, obviously, tremendous repression. You also have the issue where there's no transition. You know, very, very long-staying leaders who will, in some cases, uh, go to quite extreme means to keep that power. So human rights violations arise there. And then thirdly, I think there's the issue of rights which up until now have not been recognised in a lot of societies, and particularly we can mention here these LGBTI rights. And, you know, I think in my own society, we had a very acrimonious debate in the mid-1980s around law decriminalising uh, male homosexual practice. Uh, thank God we, we got there, but not by much in our parliament. But this is, this is a huge issue now to establish these rights in, in, in many, many countries. So, yes, there are many distressing developments, but... Uh, what to do in a practical yeah, terms as a development do. agency, you get on and work as you can to push the boundaries and remind people that all countries did sign the Millennium Declaration. Everyone signed up to the Universal Declaration of Rights. They make all these other commitments. Let's try to realise them. Well, that's the big question. How can the international society pull together, as you said, what to do in this situation or crisis? Pansani. I just think you should speak and see what well, happens. Well, I'm getting different messages from, from, from your technicians. We can hear you. <laughs> so I, th I, I think it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Um, what we can do? Well, we, we can do many things. I think the first is to recommit and restate the values we stand by. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you read it, it is so enlightened in recognizing our common humanity, our, the need, the requirement to live in freedom from want and freedom from fear. So the importance of the normative framework should be recognized. There are also concrete actions that are possible. UNDP, the UN Office of Human Rights, other partners in the UN system, bilaterals, and so on. We work in countries where there are human rights challenges. Often, they're not or not only the result of a lack of a political will, they're also the result of lack of capacities, knowledge, resources. There we can help. But we can also help when there is no political or limited political will. We have a voice. We can advocate. I would like to congratulate Norway for um, putting its action where its principles are by preparing the white paper that I really look forward to read in its full English translation, um, having had access only to the summary. Um, a paper that recognizes that a foreign policy cannot be detached from the principle a country stands by, that it cannot respect human rights internally, and then whenever a political or an economic consideration comes in, everything is overridden in their relations with other states. So I think that is another important area. Um, finally, 
there are many other dimensions, but I think one that I would like to, to underline, because it is a positive trend, is that over time we've seen the United Nations Security Council becoming increasingly robust in recognizing that there where there is conflict and a peacekeeping or a peace building intervention and presence of the international community is necessary, this has to be accompanied by human rights monitoring, reporting and support to making sure that uh, accountability takes place and there is justice. Thank you. And now I can spot that the, the Peace Prize winner is in on his way. So please welcome 2014 Nobel Peace Prize winner Kailash Satyarkin. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, please. Hi. Good to see you again. Thank you. Please come here. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Nice. How has the days been? Uh, hectic. Hectic, but yes. <laughs> uh, but quite exciting. Yes. We are in the middle of a conversation about this recent situation with a strong normative framework on human rights, many conventions, signs, strong tools, but on the other hand, horrific violations and terrible situations. Flavia Pansier said that 2014 has been the worst year for the UN Commissioner of Human Rights. So let me ask you, in your important work with, uh, with, with, with children's slavery, has this normative framework been of any use to you? Uh, definitely, but let me tell you one thing that when we talk of human rights and the human rights framework, even the child rights frameworks, so one strong aspect is the constitutional and legal frameworks. Uh, but more importantly, I would think that we have to create a culture of human rights. One hand, Laws are very important as the tools, but who is going to use the tools and when? That is very important. And another aspect that whether we internalize the human rights in our day-to-day -day life, and that has to reflect in your behavior. So that's why I am asking more for a culture of human rights. Do you think that's strong enough? What do you think, Helen Clark, a culture of human rights? Well, I, I think Kailash is quite right to say that having the right laws and institutions in place are one thing, uh, but the other is for citizens to be aware, to be empowered, to be able to claim rights. So there's been an initiative we ran, uh, have run over a number of years around legal empowerment so that people can uh, claim their rights, know what they are and be able to access them. Without that, they remain formal statements without uh, people, people knowing what really should be happening for them. Uh, minister, minister, do you believe in a culture of human rights? Of course, I, I believe in a culture of human rights. Uh, yeah, but I think I mean, is that strong enough? Does it so, so in I, this I, fight of values? Let me uh, say that um, UN have three pillars. One being the Security Council and Peace and Reconciliation. Secondly, the Development Pillar. And then it is the Human Rights Pillar. But Sometimes I feel that the third pillar uh, is a little bit forgotten. And I think what uh, the Nobel laureate is underlining is that human rights and respect for others is also a prerequisite for avoiding a situation that will end up in, in war and also in conflicts. And a prerequisite for development is the respect for other human beings. How can you develop without respecting girls? How can you develop if you have child labor? How can you develop without respecting the fundamental values that we built our societies on? And I think we also tend to forget that the incredible growth and poverty eradication that we have seen now for decades is built on a framework and respect 
of the UN Charter. And when we are now seeing a situation where there is relativism when it comes to the UN Charter and basic human rights, I think we are moving into the wrong direction and then we have to say that this we cannot accept and we have to speak out. Let me bring up another issue connected to this. The digital world brings us together. Yesterday I saw a, a video from you freeing children slaves. Is that a, a good democratic tool? Is it a tool for human rights or is it the opposite? Well, when we liberate the children, we definitely work under the human rights frameworks and legal frameworks. What these people are doing is illegal and what we try to achieve through the law. But in each of such operations when we rescue children, women or men from these situations, it's, it looks like humanitarian work, but we are reinforcing that the laws of the land are supreme and we have to respect them. We have to reactivate and revitalize those uh, legal rights which are guaranteed for those people. But more importantly for me, the underlining principle to work with deepest respect for nonviolence. Though we are attacked many times, but all the time, each time, I make sure that none of my colleagues, none of my teammates even raise the hand against anyone. So that's why um, I have scars on all my body. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I never touched anyone like that in my life <laughs> to it. So uh, these situations have to be maintained and at, sometimes it is difficult because the spontaneous reaction or uh, emotional reaction could be like that. But one has to practice to respect the non-violence also in such situations. But the attention you now have gotten with the Nobel Peace Prize, how that, you think that will help you? Will that be your, make your work smoother, easier? If you can call your kind of work smooth. Um, well, there are three different things. <laughs> smoother, easier. Uh, it would be smoother. I... Um, or helpful, you said. So it would definitely be helpful. It has already has been helpful so far. Um, we, are, we are getting tremendous response from the people, tremendous attention about the issue and uh, recognition to the issue. It never happened before. Uh, when the Nobel Peace Prize announcement was made, suddenly we saw that um, unprecedented attention has been given to the most vulnerable children and the children who are deprived of all their rights and right to childhood. But this morning, when I uh, was talking to my friends in India and other places, I found that yesterday was even bigger day. After the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony, everybody in the world is talking about children and child rights mm -hmm. because of Malala, definitely, uh, the youngest Nobel laureate, and of course, uh, because of my work, though I am not a child, uh, <laughs> if you look at my age, but, <laughs> but I feel that I'm a child inside. Yeah. So it makes sense that there is a young lady who is a child and I am also a child, so we connect it. So it will make um, us definitely much more helpful. Uh, I doubt that it would become so easy because we are fighting against an evil and that evil is an organized crime. Uh, like trafficking of children or tra trafficking of human beings, as we know, is the third largest lucrative trade in the world, illicit trade in the world. It generates $150 billion. So even attention doesn't so help. Attends, no, but that is the beginning. The mm -hmm. attention would be the beginning to make our work easier and the works of other, so many people easier. But it's a process. It will go gradually. It cannot be done in one go, but hopefully it will be done. So the change begins with consciousness. Change begins with concern and then change begins with action. So let us begin with raising the consciousness which has happened or happening very fast mm -hmm. and then the concern would arise and the action that would be translated into the action mm -hmm. and then I think um, it would be easier. And let me also um, quote Gandhiji once more. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi once said in such situations that first they ignore you and then they laugh at you then they fight with you, and finally you will win.
<laughs> I think uh, the engagement of uh, Kailash and all his movement also shows that one individual uh, can make a huge difference. We have seen positive development when it comes to ch child labor uh, the last decade, and I think this is also a result of uh, his work and other um, actors in the civil society's work. It's about bringing the, this up and, and we being conscious about it. And I think yesterday everyone that um, were listening to your speech, there were uh, different things that touched us. But for me, when I went to bed last night, I was again thinking about uh, this, uh, what you mentioned about these children uh, suing uh, these footballs and balls and never being able to play with them. Mm. And for me, it was like, these are concrete examples and it makes such an impression and makes such a strong impression that it also commits us all to work for education and against uh, child labor. And uh, what I think is also very good is that we have seen that it is possible to change this development. Who would have thought 10 years ago that it was possible to halven the amount of people living in extreme poverty in the world? I think we, we all know that we can eradicate all extreme poverty and child labor by 2030 if we know work really in a uh, aligned way and put all the necessary resources into the new SDG. So that's the commitment that needs to come out of this. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the power of the Nobel Peace Prize is to really put the spotlight on huge challenges that people are dealing with, the child rights, child labour issues. And uh, in the case of Malala, she is a, a human face of the challenge of reaching the 58 million children who are not yet in school today, let alone the countless uh, millions more who don't get the chance to finish primary education and go on to secondary and other opportunities. So we can read about those numbers, but when someone, in the case of Malala, a highly articulate uh, teenager comes forward and says, you know, this is the way it is, we sit up. And, and I think it, it's just inspirational how uh, she has emerged as a role model for children wanting to complete their education, for the girl child, and, and motivating all of us to do our bit to support. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kailash, may I ask you, uh, child labour is maybe perhaps as not as black and white as seen from, from Norway. How, in your view, can we act and live in ways that secure the right of every child to have a childhood? Well, uh, we cannot generalise all child work. There are children who are helping the families and learning some family trait but definitely going to school and completing their education. So there's no compromise with the uh, formal education or uh, good education. The second is that the children who are working because uh, they are cheap labor, they are preferred over the adults because they are easily, uh, easy to be exploited, more vulnerable physically and mentally, they cannot form the trade unions, they cannot go to the court of law, they cannot go on a strikes, etc. So that is the pull factor. And the third one is the children who are enslaved, the children who are bought and sold like animals and even in lesser prices than animals. And um, they, there is no room for human identity, human dignity, human face, human name they just become slave and even worse than animals. So, if the children are going to school and helping the family or learning some trade after a certain age, 15, 16, 70 year old young boys and girls, I don't think that anything is bad in it. If, but there must not be any element of force or element of exploitation, economic, physical, mental, sexual, no exploitation. So it can continue. But children of any age, or even the adults of any age, if they are enslaved, and there is a loss of freedom, denial of freedom, it is not negotiable. It is not negotiable. We have to rescue them immediately. Whatever circumstances are, there is no excuse of poverty. How we can allow Slavery to continue under the garb of poverty or with an excuse of poverty that they, since they are poor, so they have to work like slaves. It is not possible. 
there are there have to be strong uh, laws there should be political will to enforcement those laws capacity of the agencies and intention of the enforcement agency to implement those laws and more importantly investment on education education is the preventive measure for all forms of child labor education is the curative measure education is the most powerful rehabilitative measure good quality meaningful education have to be given to every child thank you very much and the peace prize days are as i said extremely busy and part of the panel has to leave us now to go on with further um, arrangements so thank you very much and flavia could you please stay yes thank you so much <laughs> I'm going to receive you at the Prime Minister's office, so oh. I have to go before you. Okay, lovely. Yeah. So we'll go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, Flavia. Good. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you once again. You're welcome. I'll go now. Yes. Yeah.